hi, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here. I'm Lauren Tarshis. Um, I wear a few hats here at Scholastic. I am the, um, I oversee the magazine, um, our magazines plus division 24 magazine, 25 different magazines. I write the I Survive series and I am lucky enough to be part of the StoryWorks and Scope team. We are so thrilled to be here today and I'm especially thrilled to introduce you to my colleague and friend, Alessandra Potenza. Hi everyone, um, my name is Alessandra Ali for Friends. I am the editor of StoryWorks and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be here today with you, Lauren, and with all of you joining us from all over the country. Um, Lauren and I love being part of your classrooms. We love taking you on journeys and writing stories that take you back into the history, the science, into the world, and really make you want to learn more on your own. And we have a very big story to share with you today because today is the 100th and 50th anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire that happened on October 8th, 1871. And this, I really also fire prevention week and these events are connected in a really interesting way. So this is an amazing story. It's the most famous fire in American history. It started in a barn, spread throughout the city. Um, 300 people lost their lives. 100,000 100, people were homeless. Um, we are going to take you back in time to that day. We're going to explore how that event that happened 150 years ago connects to our lives today, the lessons we've learned, how it even makes us a bit safer today. Um, and we are just so thrilled to be able to take you into our research process and on this journey. Right, Ale? Yes. And um, just before we begin, uh, please leave your questions for Laura in the comments. We will try to answer them uh, later on during this live. And afterwards, we will select three winners who will receive um, an autographed copy of Lauren's I Survived book uh, on the Great Chicago Fire. Awesome. So, so Ali, let's, let's, let's start with the basics, okay? Here, let, this is Chicago today. I don't, it is such a beautiful city. It's one of my very favorite cities. Um, it is famous for being the third largest city in America. It is on this gorgeous Lake Michigan. There's a river that you can take a river trip. You can take a boat ride down and see all these amazing skyscrapers and um, all these lively neighborhoods that are so diverse. It is, um, Ali, have you been there, right? Of course. Yes, I have been. I visited in 2007 when I was uh, studying abroad in Kansas. I was an exchange student and um, I went there with my host family for spring break and St. Patrick's Day. And I, I loved it. I had so much fun in Chicago. Yeah, our family loves it. Here's one of our family pictures. Our daughter's not in this picture. She's very upset about that. But this just gives a great sense of sort of the vibrancy of Chicago today. And our, now Ale gets very upset when I say this because Ale is from Italy. So she doesn't like to hear that my favorite part of Chicago is the pizza because she thinks that only Italians make the best pizza. But you have to admit Ale, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> so um, so what is, you know, but there's something really, it wasn't, there's something that's really important to remember as we're talking about the Chicago fire, it wasn't always this big modern city, right? Right. Um, I mean, compared to many big cities, Chicago is very young. Um, in New York City, where Laura and I are tuning in from and where the scholastic offices are, uh, was founded in the 1600s. As Lauren said, I'm from Rome, Italy, uh, which was founded more than 2000 years ago. But it wasn't until the 1800s that Chicago really started to become a city. I mean, before then, it was a trading post in, in a swamp, um, like you see here in this image. Yeah. But as America was growing, Chicago really boomed. And by the 1860s, it was well on its way to becoming one of the most important cities in America. But there was a problem with Chicago, right, as it was growing. There was a very, 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 very big problem as it was growing. And it's really important. There's a few things that I discovered in my research about the growth of Chicago. I read somewhere that there had never been a city in all of history that had ever grown so fast. So it just, what was that, you know, sort of lovely little swamp exploded into this massive city. And the problem was that it was pretty much all made of wood. 
Um, America at that time, the middle of the country was still large. A lot of, there was a lot of wilderness, a lot of these enormous forests, some of the biggest on earth. And these forests became, you know, were, were being cut down. That wood was being shipped to Chicago and it was just this cheap, great material. So pretty much everything in that city was made of wood. The houses, the buildings, the sidewalks, even many of the streets had wooden pavings, you know, paving uh, bricks made. Um, so um, even buildings that looked super fancy that were covered with stone or marble, very often just beh behind that thin little skin of, of stone was a wooden frame. And Ale, Ale comes to us from our science magazine. So she particularly can explain why it, it was such a problem that there was all this wood in this fast growing city. Right. Wood is, is very flammable. It can, um, it, it can burn very easily. Right. right. So that, that was the problem. And, it, and so people were, were extremely nervous about Chicago because fires were very common in cities all over the world. And um, in Chicago, there were many warnings that this was a disaster waiting to happen. The summer leading up to that fire was boiling hot, very dry, it barely rained after July. And the fall continued with this hot, dry weather. And um, it's actually very similar weather to what you know, we've, we've seen in the West in, in recent years, California, Oregon, Washington, where we've had all of those terrible wildfires. So again, I'm always looking for connections between yesterday and today, history and today. So we can imagine what that weather was like. And a lot of people became extremely fearful, especially Chicago's fire chief. I mean, he was warning everyone that a huge fire was likely to happen. There were fires happening every single day throughout the summer and fall. I mean, most of them were small and the fire department put them out quickly. But then on October 8th, a fire smarter started in a barn. It spread so quickly because it was windy and ashes and pieces of you know burning wood sailed across the river a mile away, landed on rooftops, more fire started. So the fire departments tried, kept trying to put these fires out, but no sooner had they put out one than another one had started in another neighborhood. So this fire burned for three days. And by the time it was finished, 300 people had lost their lives. Um, it is just incredible to look at some of the photograph, some of the images from that fire. Now, this is something that Ali and I really wanted to delve into a little bit. These, these, these images of the Chicago fire were created right in the, the days and weeks and months after the fire. There were no photographs of the Chicago fire. There was photography in 1871. Um, cameras had been invented, but they weren't like our iPhones where you could be running around snapping quick pictures to take a portrait or a picture of someone. It would take you know 15 minutes of standing very still. So the images that we have of that fire were created by artists, but those artists worked for newspapers and magazines and they really were, their jobs were to make as realistic a picture as possible. So these are just part of the this whole type of research that Ale and I do, and I do in my I Survive books, that uses what are known as primary sources. And these are articles, letters, diaries, artifacts, and artwork created during that time. So Ale, you and I have just studied these and you can just, you can really, um, you can just really feel the, um, the fear that, um, and the, the desperation that people, this one in particular, just really, just really grabbed me. So, uh, Lauren, you explained a little bit, right? The city was completely parched. The weather was very dry. But do we know how the Great Chicago Fire started? Well, this, of course, has been studied by so many different historians and fire experts. So there are a few facts that everyone agrees on. As you said, this weather, this weather was bad. And again, as we see today in the West, when you have a long period of time without any rain and you have you know, lots of wood, whether the wood is in a city or in a forest, you, you know that you are facing a serious risk. Um, and then of course we had all this fuel, all of that wood. Um, and there's another piece of, of factual information that nobody disputes, which is where the fire started. It started in a barn on DeCoven Street, and that barn was owned by Margaret and uh, O'Leary and her husband, Patrick. They had five children, um, and it, the fire started in the barn, you know, in, it, in late at night, and it very quickly spread all over the city. So those facts, the weather, the wood, 
and where it started. Everyone agrees on that. But there is now, this is where things get very strange and very, in my opinion, deeply tragic and unfair. Margaret O'Leary, let me just tell you a minute about her. So she was a, a woman from Ireland. She and her husband came over and she was super hardworking. She created a very successful dairy business in this little barn. She had cows, she would milk them every morning. She had a wagon and a horse. Everyone in the neighborhood loved her fresh milk that she and her children would deliver in the morning. Her other older kids went to school. Um, she was very respected. And Margaret, you know, she had been, she and Patrick had been asleep when the fire started. Neighbors knocked on their door and woke them up. But in the days after the fire, a rumor started that that Mrs. O'Leary and her cow had been in the barn late at night, that she had been milking her cow and her, her grumpy cow had kicked over a lantern that had ignited piles of hay. And that is how the Chicago fire started. And that was not true. That was not true. But that rumor spread and became really locked into people's mind as fact. And so I don't know how many of you have heard about Mrs. O'Leary and her cow, but it's so she's it became this sort of the most famous part of the, the entire Chicago fire story. Over many years, there were songs written about it. There's a song here. I even found some lyrics for you, Ali. I haven't shared this with you yet, but um, there's a very famous um, there's a very famous song called um, Old um, a hot time in old town. And it goes, I'm not going to sing it. I promise because everyone would run away from their computers late one night when we were all in bed, Mrs. O'Leary lit a lantern in the shed, her cow knocked it over, then winked, then winked her eye and said, there'll be a hot time in old town tonight. So this became oh, yeah. kind of almost like a joke. This painting here, you guys can look this up. It's such a, this, this is painted by a man named Norman Rockwell, who's one of the most famous artists in America. American history. He painted this, I think, in the 40s or 50s or when he was painting. He's known for his, you know, story uh, paintings that capture American life. Here is supposedly Mrs. O'Leary milking her cow in the middle of the night. Um, and look at the look at that cow's eyes staring at the lantern like I'm going to knock that over and start a fire. So um, this is tragic. Um, Mrs. O'Leary knew better. She would never have milked a cow in the middle of the night. Um, you know, this again, she, it, even into the 1970s, cartoons were made. So um, it, it, you know, sounds kind of funny, except it destroyed Mrs. O'Leary. It just, just imagine, I keep wondering what would it have been like to be blamed, wrongly blamed for setting the fire that destroyed the fastest growing city in America. I mean, can you imagine the shame and the horror and the fear you'd feel? I mean, she was, it was terrible. They were driven, you know, basically driven out of the city. They ended up living at the very edges of Chicago. They, for a while I heard they used a different last name, Walsh. Um, and generations of that family never really um, got over it, even though, again, it was not true. There had been an investigation about it by the fire department. Nobody, you know, she did not start this fire. But again, it's this interesting connection, Ale, between what we see today, like on social media. It's so easy for a rumor um, or fault, you know, something false to go viral. Now, Mrs. O'Leary lived at a time before Snapchat and Twitter and Instagram, but her story went viral through newspaper stories and books and songs and cartoons. And, um, and she never recovered and got over that shame. So that's one of the parts of this research journey that, um, that really just really got to me. And, and you and I have talked a lot about the very, um, the really terrible underlying reason why Mrs. O'Leary was blamed. Yeah, I mean, there was terrible prejudice against immigrants at the time, and especially uh, Irish immigrants who had flocked to the city of Chicago and worked in slaughterhouses and mills and factories. And so there was this anti-immigrant hatred at the time that was very common, and people were looking for a scapegoat, someone to blame this on. And Catherine O'Leary was just swirled and swept in the middle of all this. And as you said, it ruined her life. And yeah, what an important lesson from, from history for, for all of us and how 
terrible lies can be and rumors can be and how they have a real impact on, on people's lives. Right. And how prejudice and hatred feed into that. You know, that basically, I think when something bad happens, I've written about so many, you know, disasters from history. I remember writing about when I wrote about the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that happened in ancient Rome almost 2000 years ago, people wanted to blame, you know, gods and goddesses, right? We always want to find a reason for something. And poor Mrs. O'Leary was, um, was, was, was the target of that. So um, the story wars and scope stories that we just talked about are a genre that's called narrative nonfiction. But then your I Survive book is historical fiction. So Lauren, what is the difference between these two genres? And what was like to write about the great Chicago fire in the two genres? Well, you know, very often the stories that I write in StoryWorks and Scope become I Survived stories because readers of StoryWorks, I always listen to them. I love them so much. And a lot of times if I've written about something like Mount St. Helens or Mount Vesuvius or the Revolution Era, where they say, you need to write an I Survived book about that. And the same thing happens in the re reverse. Sometimes I'll write, about a I'll write about something in an I Survived book like the Chicago Fire, which came first. And then a lot of I Survive readers or StoryWorks readers suggest that I write it in, in, in StoryWorks, or sometimes it's just a story I'm dying to share and do in another genre, but they are different genres. And these are very different stories. What they have in common is a lot of research, tons of research. Um, I, we already talked about those amazing primary source documents, which I love being in a library, being in a historical society, studying photographs, going to museums, studying artifacts. Um, and um, they are both based in fact, right? So both enable me to share the story of this very important event with you readers. But while the story of the Chicago fire that I wrote in StoryWorks and Scope is, is supposed, is, I hope it's an exciting story, but the people I'm writing about are real people. I write about Mrs. O'Leary and I write about the awesome, amazing Bessie Bradwell, who was only 13 years old, got separated from her family, ends up, you know, in the middle of the chaos of the fire and was just, an amazing model of how you can be resilient. She kept her, her, she kept her wits about you. She was very lucky to find friends of her parents. She was reunited with her parent, her family, and she ended up saving her mother's whole business because she rescued a really important book. So those are real people. Um, my I Survive stories are very different, Ollie, because even though I'm doing that, all of that research, and I want this all to be very fact, you know, it's all fact-based, I'm also creating an entire fictional world. That's why it's called historical historical fiction. So my character, my main character is Oscar and um, his, um, he gets caught up. I had to figure out a whole plot. Why did he go to Chicago? What, what is going to lead him through the fire? I have to have a whole second exciting plot to put into the Chicago fire. Sometimes, I don't know if you guys will imagine, I always think of it almost like right, making a ship inside a bottle. The bottle is the historical event. And then I build a ship inside that historical event and I want it to be super exciting. So in this case, my character Oscar gets and somehow stumbles into this you know, evil gang of people who are, um, and he helps out two orphans named Jenny and her little brother Bruno and they band together and they are escaping the flames that are taking over Chicago on, on that night. The I Survive books are a lot more work um, because I have to do a lot more research um, they take so many drafts. And I've also traveled to every single place that I've written about in my, I've written 21 I Survive books, just starting the 22nd. And I've traveled to all of the places that I've written about. Um, and there's only one that I haven't um, traveled to, actually, that I haven't traveled to. One is Japan to write about the tsunami, because it was just too far away. And, and it was a very overly ambitious trip. The second I want I Survive readers to see if they can figure it out. What would have been a, one of the topics in my I Survive series that would have been almost impossible for me to visit? You can stick it in the chat, but we'll get to that later. So my Chicago research journey was a really exciting journey. It wasn't, you know, I did drag my family around, but while they were eating pizza and, you know, and, and going to the Bulls games, I was going to museums. I was able to, you know, really even see artifacts that were saved um, from the fire, um, treasures that people had managed to, to take with them. And when I'm, when I'm, when I am writing 
when I'm doing these research trips, what I'm doing is I'm really trying to bring my characters to life. So I'm walking around and I'm trying to see these places through the eyes of a child who would have lived there at the time. And that's, and that's, that's really the big difference, Ale, is that there's this whole fictional side of it that, um, that takes me on a very different sort of writing journey. So you wrote so much about the Great Chicago Fire, as you just said, that this amazing book and these two articles for StoryWorks and Scope. Um, but one of the surprising things that I just learned recently was that fires were a constant threat to like many cities all around the world, right? There were serious fires in New York, in New Orleans, in London, even outside of the US. But the Great Chicago Fire is different, right? As if we still remember it 150 years later, we're having this event right now. You know, why is that? Why are we still talking about the Chicago Fire? That's, that's such a great question. And it's an important question I think that kids can ask anytime we're reading about something. Why do we remember certain events? Why do certain historical events get locked into our brains? I mean, I, I'm, I could, we could spend hours talking about that in general, Ali, but I would say there are three reasons um, why this event is um, still important, still worth talking about. Um, first of all, it, even though we're, there, were, there were tons of other fires, I mean, fire was a huge risk in cities, really, um, until, you know, until electricity was, was really invented, because think about it, before electricity, not only did you have all this wood, but people were reading by candlelight, they were staying warm around coal, you know, coal stoves, there were sparks everywhere. So there were just a lot more ways for, for fires to start. Plus, today we have smoke detectors, we have fire extinguishers, we have fire departments that can get here in minutes, we can call 911. So all of that made, um, that didn't exist way back then. Um, the um, But the Chicago fire was pretty tragic. I mean, I hear some more of these. These, these are actual photographs, Ali, that were taken after the fire. These are not, these are not um, pieces of artwork. These are photographs. And again, I just, you know, st I've, I've spent so long really studying these pictures. And you can see, you know, 3.3 miles of Chicago was, was reduced to ash. The entire downtown, enormous neighborhoods, 100,000 people were homeless. I mean, it was the scale of that disaster was, was just remarkable. It was news all over the world. And remember, this was this fastest growing city and it was so important. And, and um, so I think it, it just, it really did hit people, not only in Chicago, here's one of my favorite pictures of a news, of a member how newspapers used to be sold by newsboys and sometimes girls who would, you know, look at he's barefoot. Many of them were kids who didn't have homes and they earned a few pennies a day selling newspapers and here's a newsie calling out the Chicago fire. So it was really a terrible fire, but here's the thing, Chicago was reborn. And the, the thing about the Chicago fire is it had a very happy ending. And we in America love a story of rebirth, right? It's so right after the fire, town leaders, business leaders, people, you know, even Bessie's, Bessie's family, Bessie Bradwell's family, they said, we're going to rebuild Chicago, but we're going to make it even better than it was. And, and really, and many, many people feel that it never would be that gorgeous city where we love to visit if it hadn't been for the fire, because it enabled them to rebuild in a very new way. And it, remarkably, by 1893, and this is another thing that you guys can go research on your own, like another little research journey you can take, look up the Columbian Ex Exposition of 1893. This was the world, the first World's Fair held in America. And a lot of cities wanted to host it, kind of like the Olympics, like New York wanted it, Washington wanted it, Boston wanted it. But, but the, it was decided that it should go to Chicago um, so that it would be like Chicago's announcement that we're back. And this was this incredible event where in, millions of people came to Chicago. This was the, uh, the Ferris wheel had just been invented and people got to see this amazing city. They called it the dream city. Look, we're all rebuilt. So that's one reason, Ali, why this story I think has us, we're still talking about it is Chicago was reborn and it, you know, quickly reclaimed its place as a very important city, which it remains today. The other really important thing is that it is a, um, it made us safer. 
that right after the fire, people realized we got to change, you know, this, this can't continue. So there were laws passed. You couldn't build a building in um, downtown Chicago out of wood. They really looked at the fire department. Um, and then here's a little known fact that I think I shocked you with when I shared it with you when we were preparing is that I never knew this, but there was a second fire that happened in Chicago and it is called the second Chicago fire. Another thing you guys can look up and it happened in just three years after the um, Chicago fire. And it didn't burn as much, but it did burn a neighborhood. And that's really turbocharged all of the changes. People just said, because all these new laws were being talked about and we're going to make these changes, but we know how slow things are. So that really just pushed into motion all these big changes. Now you're not allowed to build any, anything of wood anywhere in Chicago. They grew the fire department, rearranged it. They put 300 men on the street every single night to watch out for fires after that. They even changed the water system because think of how important it is when you're trying to keep fires, you know, keep people safe from fires that you have a water system that can have fire trucks with hoses and, you know, and pumps. So that Ali, I think um, is, is just, you know, those are two really, really big reasons. And the other reason is that, um, and I want you to tell this because it connects to what we're what we're really focusing on today, fire prevention. And I think this is a really cool little fact that you dug up. Right. Yes. Yes. Fire Prevention Week was was really born out of the Great Chicago Fire because um, in 1911, on the 40th anniversary of the fire, the Fire Marshals Association of North America decided to use the anniversary as a way to to really inform and educate the public about fire safety. And then in 1925, President Calvin Coolidge created Fire Prevention Week and as a national observance, and it's existed ever since, and it's made all of us safer from fires. It's amazing. Now, so, I think, yeah, yeah, Lauren, I think I think we're getting some questions from people. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. So, would you would you yeah. like to to start us off, Ale? Yes, and just uh, you know, remember to drop them in the comments. We have some here uh, from kids who use home base. Do you want to tell us, Lauren, what? Yes. Home base is? We we love our home base kids. We I mean we love all of you, but home base is this super cool. It's a it's an interactive um, community for kids that is built around um, our you know our favorite scholastic books and series. And you can go in and meet other kids who love to read and you can visit these different, you can see live author events. Sometimes I do them there. So we got a few questions from home base users and it's just something that we were really excited about. Right, so there is a question from Iridescent Twilight 22. Well, is that her real name, Ale, or their real name? No, I, I, I doubt that, but it's a very, very creative name. But um, Iridescent you can make up your own Twilight. Name, home base, right? They ask, um, what got you interested in history? Well, um, definitely the, I always tell kids, this is super important. I want you to remember this, that history is not just about dates and facts. Of course it is. We want all of the dates and facts to be right, but it's really history is, history is stories. It's the stories of ordinary people like Bessie Bradwell, like Margaret O'Leary, like all of you, like us. And that's what fascinates me. There's so many stories when I, you know, a lot of kids have asked me like, isn't it kind of hard or sad to be always writing about these really intense tragedies? I mean, and sometimes it really is when it just gets to be quite overwhelming at times to be writing about something like the Chicago fire, where I know so many people suffered, but in the midst of all of this sadness, I find examples of people who are so resilient, like Bessie, um, even Margaret had to move on her fam, her, her, one of her sons ended up being one of the richest people in the Chicago, Chicago. That's a whole other story. So the idea of we can face really difficult things, and sometimes it takes us a very long time to grieve and, and get over it. I actually don't like the name of my series, I Survived. I wish I could change the name because it sort of means like, oh, I survive and I get over it and I move right away. But no, we have to take, it takes a lot of time sometimes to feel safe again after something bad happens, um, to grieve a loss. Um, we have to help each other. We have to know how to ask for help. But what I have learned, Ali, in all of these stories that I've written is I've just found so many amazing examples of people over and over again who can eventually move forward and feel happy again. So I think that that's the, a great, a great um, question that I always love to answer. Absolutely. And then we have another question from uh, Sunset Dusk 19. 
What's the coolest thing you found out about the fire? Oh my gosh. Well, this will, do we have another four hours, Ale? Cause I want to talk about it with everyone. So the craziest thing, this is the craziest fact. And I bet some of you kids know this, but the, the deadliest fire in American history happened on the very same night as the Chicago fire 150 years ago today, but it wasn't the Chicago fire. It was the great Peshtigo fire that happened a few hundred miles north of Chicago in this town called Peshtigo. And that, that, I mean, I think more than a thousand people lost their lives in that fire. It was just this unbelievable disaster, but it was, and it was actually part of that same weather system, Ale, that dry, windy weather. This was in the middle. And a lot of the wood that came that, that built Chicago actually came from the forests around Peshtigo. I wrote about this in a, in a StoryWorks story, in a StoryWorks in, in Scope story. Um, it was called, the my story was called The Blood Red Night. And that was the most just fascinating fact. And it connects to that, that question you asked me, why do we remember some things and not other things? Why are we still talking? Talking about Chicago and not Peshtigo. And right away, the Peshtigo fire was really overshadowed by what happened in the big city of Chicago. Definitely. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, okay, one more question uh, from Liliana. What was the first I Survived book that you ever wrote? Oh, that was the Titanic. It, it, an all time favorite of all yes, of our yes. in StoryWorks and Scope 2. Uh, then we have another question from Rebecca, who's a teacher, and she asks, uh, my students would like to know, how do you get your ideas for your articles in scope? But I would also like to add story works to that in the yes. I like books. Yeah. You know, I'm just, I'm distracted by all these amazing questions I'm seeing in the chat alley. And that's a great one. You know, we're always on the lookout. We're just always, our eyes are always open for stories that are going to fascinate you, that are going to open doors in your mind of curiosity that you're going to want to go learn more about when I when you read a story that I write or Ale writes or Kristen writes in scope that Allison writes in story works or any of my books or any any history books I want you to ask yourself I want you to finish it and this is the question I want you to ask yourself what do I want to learn next because all the stories we write are doors um, that take you into other areas. So after reading about the Chicago fire, you might want to read more about the world exposition. You might want to learn more about what life was like in 1871 or the Peshtigo fire or train travel, which was such an important part. So I think that's the answer. We're just, our eyes are always open and through our reading, through our travels. And, um, and that's, that's our goal. Um, another question from Stephanie, uh, how do you get started with the research process when you're writing a new I Survive book? Well, I start really by reading and thinking. Um, I try to read books that are just sort of simple and lay out the facts. And you guys can do this too in your research. I really recommend it. I often just try to read, I mean, believe it or not, I really often try to read even a picture book. If, if I know nothing about something, I'm writing about an avalanche right now for my 22nd I Survive book that happened in 1910. Now there's no children's picture books about it, but there are some very simple books and I start because I just want to really understand the basics. And then I build out from there. Um, and I want to read as many books as possible. I want to then give myself time to organize my thoughts and then decide, okay, what else do I want to research? I need to learn more about 1910. I need to more, learn more about trains because this was a train disaster. I need to learn more about the area where it was where this happened, which was the Cascade Mountains in Washington state. So there, for each building block of the story, there's often just an entire body of research. And of course I have to plan my research trip. That's, yeah, that's so interesting. And we have so many questions for you, Lauren. I hope you can get to them. Maybe afterwards, we don't have time for all of them. Uh, in fact, I wanted to go back to a question uh, from home base uh, that connects us back to um, Fire Prevention Week because Magical Athena 5 asks, what's the most important thing we we'll learned about fighting fire since the Chicago fire? And also is Fire Prevention Week this week because of it? And I think we, we answered part of that already. Uh, but also it's important to know that Fire Prevention Week is there because you are empowered to keep yourself safe. There are certain things you can do, right, Lauren? There are, and Ali and I talked a lot about this, and teachers, we did provide, you'll see in a minute, we provided some really good resources for you to share with um, kids and family, because I think, 
I, I, I have four children and they will tell you that I, after spending 10 years writing I Survived around all these different disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, here's what I can tell you. If you are prepared, you are much more likely to survive. I can't be any more simple. So um, for fires, the fire drills you do at school, pay attention. When you go, uh, you know, my kids have learned, like when we go to a hotel, they look the, for, you know, they look for the fire exit, just know where it is because if it's really dark. Um, so preparing, taking some responsibility, not to be terrified all the time and like, oh my gosh, I know, because we're not, you know, chances are you're not going to be in a fire. But if you are and you take a little bit of time to um, practice a fire drill at home, where, you know, what are the ways to get out of your house? Ask your family about that. Practice, as silly as it sounds. One of the most important things that we did in my house is we, um, and this actually came from an experience that a friend of mine had. She, they had a house fire. It was a very frightening thing. And everyone was very new to get out of the house because that's the first thing you have to do, right? You just get out of the house. You don't try to grab all of your, you know, your, your Chromebook, sorry, teachers, or, you know, all of your, you know, all of your, your new pair of Jordans. You just get out of the house. Um, but the, they, in my friend's case, they couldn't find her nine-year-old boy for a little while because they hadn't agreed on where they were going to meet out of the house. And you want to make sure it's not in the streets. And if it's in the city, that's a safe place. So um, making sure that you have your emergency plan, taking some responsibility in your house, the best defense against a um, fire are smoke alarms. Do you have them in the bedrooms? Are they working? Do you check the batteries every year? If it starts to chirp, do you not just like turn it off? Do you make sure you change the battery? So all of those, um, all of those things, I will say that kids um, are, you guys are, are absolutely, old enough to start to take responsibility for helping your families. And I have become so um, just serious about this because I have seen over and over again, how people taking time to understand tornado safety, if they live in a tornado prone area, hurricane safety, and certainly for all of us, no matter where we live, fire safety. Definitely. So we put, as um, our helpers have put in the chat, we have uh, a lot of teaching resources uh, for Fire Prevention Week. We also created this beautiful hub that uh, where you will find the links to the story works and spoke stories we talked about, our dazzling uh, behind the scene video, and then uh, worksheets for your and lesson plans for your ELA block. And um, if you want to buy books, there's a link to an amazing independent bookstore uh, in Chicago called Anderson's. And then there's a link to uh, the Red Cross and, and their tips for uh, fire safety if your students want to do uh, more research. Yeah, and so you StoryWorks people have already read um, all of our, our wonderful stories and seen our slide decks. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with StoryWorks and Scope, these are not only stories, but we create this incredible resource package to enable you to turn our stories into very powerful teaching tools for ELA, moving into science and social studies as well. So we really hope you'll explore those and Ale and the team just put so much heart and care into all of them. Wow, Ale, I'm going to stop sharing because I just want to like look at you more closely. And uh, I think I also I'm going to I think Colin, our wonderful AV guy is going to I, I, I didn't do the right thing with my cursor, but that's OK. <laughs> so what do you think? It's just been so what a what a fun experience to be able to share. We just love what we do. We, we get so excited about our stories. And even though, you know, we have the behind the scenes video and story works and we and we and scope and we try to convey as much information as we can. There's always so much more that we wanna share and to make the connection between Fire, Fire Prevention Week and to, to commemorate the anniversary of this important event and to, for you guys to start to think about the way things that happened a long ago happened, um, connect to you today. And I just wanna end, Ale, if it's okay. I wanna just, I've shared this with so many kids that I've spoken to in your classes and I'm just gonna share it again, that you guys are going through a super important event right now that people are gonna be talking about 150 years later, and that's this pandemic. And it's kind of amazing to think about that you are going to be the, the people whose stories future writers are going to rely on. This is your story. Your grandchildren, your kids, they're gonna want you to come to their classes to tell what it was like to live through this COVID 
um, a pandemic and you're going to have so many fascinating stories and lessons to share on the amazing ways your teachers supported you and how you're, you were able to go to school. And, you know, I'm sure there were really difficult things too, but I just want to say that um, you guys, your stories are so important. So I hope you're keeping track a little bit so you'll have some details to share. Absolutely. And I think that's all we got today, Ale. Is that right? It's, I think that's it. It was so nice to be with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us and, you know, Join us next time. Oh, we we'll got to share our contacts. I'm going to share again. If you please get in touch with us, we are very easy to find. Um, I'm on Twitter and so is Ale. Mm -hmm. And um, also you can always email me at, at Scholastic. I love to hear from every teacher knows how much I love to be in touch. So please stay in touch with us. Um, this will be available as a recording. So um, uh, if anyone who missed it, you can pass it on. And just a huge thank you for joining us today. And Ali, thank you for all the work you put into this. And big thanks to our friends at Scholastic, Colin, Kimon, Yannick, um, Lyra, and Bobby. Um, we're so lucky to work with such an amazing team. Bye, guys. Thank Everyone. you.